prayer. I won't do it here this morning because I'm going to be talking and busy later. I'm going to be talking and singing all morning. I'm sorry for you just to put it out of the way. I'll be later on. Father, thank you for your good job. Thank you for that you have given us grace, mercy, and peace through the gospel of Jesus Christ. Father, I'm looking forward to digging deeper into these precious truths. As we examine the agency and the claims of its authority, and we follow the true authority that is vested within each saint, each member of the living and true church of Jesus Christ. So, Father, we pray, God, that your truth would prevail in these matters and all things in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. So, we've been out of the loop for a couple of weeks, and so we're still going to the Roman Catholic controversy. We kind of take a deep four as it's gone traveling, um, and then not just on the uh, like other church uh, issues, but just to be sure, we didn't uh, go to the traffic right there, right? Okay, so that's where we left off. And uh, I want to just kind of do an overview of where we've been so far in the Roman Catholic controversy, and then share with you kind of a uh, recent experience I had, and use that as a springboard to a conversation on apologetics. Uh, I can do this quick overview and then start the chapter uh, on the gaming system. Uh, but really what it really comes down to is that there are some serious distinctions between Protestantism and Roman Catholicism. Uh, if you ask the average person who is Roman Catholic, and this question is asked often, you ask the Roman Catholic or someone who I later on you learn to be Roman Catholic, are you a Christian or are you Catholic? What is presupposed in that question? The difference. There's a difference. And you know what? Almost every Roman Catholic I've spoken to affirms that difference. Have you noticed that? They say, no, I'm not a Christian, I'm a Catholic. Where according to Catholic dogma, they are the true Christian church. They are the true divine Christian. Uh, you guys have their names as authority, and the names you see going all the way back to St. Peter. Uh, why is it important that we also affirm that distinction? Should we correct the same or all Catholics as Christians? Or should we affirm the distinction in themselves here? Why do you think that the wise thing to do? Well, um, I mean, they, they essentially, they don't believe in um, the good news, the gospel. It's different. Uh, I've confronted a, a, a gentleman who will hopefully come here at some point. Uh, he was in San Jose, and he is a, a, a Catholic. And I spoke to him yesterday, actually, and I asked him that question. You know, do you consider yourself a Catholic or a Christian? He says, I'm Catholic. And, and, he, and, and you know what his response was? He says, there's too much hypocrisy within Christianity. And I was with some other folks too, and they saw, oh, yeah, you know, that's right. There's a, it's, it's almost as if he was saying something in the Bible. Like, oh, that's what a brilliant statement. Yes, you know, you're right. And I said to him, I haven't met someone who isn't a hypocrite yet. Okay? Because every single person on the face of this earth is a hypocrite in one facet of life or the other. And I said, you know, I would stop going to Walmart because there's hypocrites there. Imagine if you, if you apply that reasoning, you apply that logic to every other facet of life, where would you go? Where would you be? You'd be left alone on your own private island with no one who wants to speak to you because apparently you are not that standard of perfection. Everyone is a hypocrite in one way or another. We all are fallen. We're all sinful. And we get into this really interesting conversation. And, and he says, the one, my problem with Christianity is that you can live your life how you want to, sinning, and then the last moment that you say, I'm going to ask Jesus on heart, and then all that is is why I'm waiting for David and you go to that. I don't think that's fair. And of course, if you can comment, this is fair. Okay? Can we talk about fair for a moment and justice? He says, we're just speaking in Spanish. He was, he was saying, uh, uh, that's not just. He uses the word just in Spanish. And so it's justo. It's not just. It's not fair. And then I said, okay, well, let's, let's talk about that for a moment. In my view, if God were to be just and God were to be fair, we would all go to hell. And the gospel, or 
going to Roman Catholicism and says, no, you can earn your salvation, that there are good people, that there, are, there is a way for us to be justified by our works. And he says, it doesn't seem fair to me that a person can live their whole life doing good things, helping the poor, doing just causes, and then someone who's been living their lives completely contrary, but at the last moment they repent and, 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 and they get to go to heaven while the other one doesn't. He says, it doesn't seem fair to me, it doesn't seem just. And he asks me, what is just, you know, to you? And I said, just as it's me, we, that they would all go to hell. And I started to quote the scripture to him. Romans 3, there's no living on any of the line. He says, no, 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 no. You're, you're, you're getting out of the book. I'm asking you, we're, you know, what would be just for you? And I said, but, but sir, by what standard are we talking about here? By what standard? And this is the famous, you know, uh, uh, line of apologetics that you hear from Jeff Irvin and others as well. But it's so true. By what standard are we talking about? He says, you, what's your standard? I said, no. Well, my standard is the Bible standard. That's my standard. He no, 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 no. You're getting a little bit. What is your standard? I'm like, I can't separate the two. I believe in this book. And this book tells me what the standard is. Therefore, I'm telling you what the standard is. And quickly, all of the folks around us are getting really frustrated with me. They start getting really upset and say, well, you know, you, you, you just, just have to accept that everyone believes what you believe, and that everyone has the same thought. I'm like, yeah, I, I accept that. That's fine. But you just said something that is kind of all language, that all Christians, the reason why you're not a Christian because all Christians are hypocrites. It's kind of an all language statement, and you all guys kind of affirmed it, and that's kind of an ignorant thing to say, and I don't understand why you're celebrating ignorance. And when my perspective is shared, you feel attacked. Interesting how that works, isn't it? And I'm telling you, and you know what? And it, 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 it dawned on me in that conversation yesterday that the world sees ignorance as a virtue. Think about that for a moment. The world looks at ignorance as a virtue. If you say something totally ignorant but it sounds nice, you are celebrating. You are elevated. It's like, oh, you know, it almost as if you said something so profound. Oh, all Christians are, are hypocrites, therefore they're not Christians. Oh, we're really a saint. There's really no substance to that. And things like that are elevated and celebrated as if it is a virtue. And I'm sorry, I don't think it's virtuous to be ignorant. I don't think it's virtuous to affirm things that are true. And that was where the argument, my, where the, the argument became was the matter of truth. I said, to me, I, I, I respect you have a different perspective. And I, I affirm your, your freedom to, 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 to live by what you believe. Uh, but at the same time, I believe the truth outweighs all those things. So is there an objective standard? Is there an objective truth? by which we can delineate between something that is true and something that is false. And I believe in an objective standard, and that objective standard is found in God's Word. That's the standard. And so I think when you're speaking to Roman Catholics, you have to bring it back to that. By what standard are we affirming things as true or false? And so I brought my conversations back to the person of Jesus. I said, Jesus is the standard of truth. He said of himself, I am the way, the truth, the life, no one comes to the Father but by me. He said of the Word of God in John 17, 17, Father, your word is truth. And so I said to this gentleman, my Roman Catholic friend, I said, what are you going to affirm here? Your subjective feeling and your subjective knowledge or the sure foundation of Christ who is God incarnate according to both Protestant and the Roman Catholic God. What are we going to hold as true? And my, I base my life on Christ's teachings. What do you base yours? What's your standard? And what's interesting is that most people who are nominally or culturally Roman Catholic, they don't live by the standard of the Word of God. They live loosely on traditions and their subjective emotions. But they're not basing their lives on the authority of the Word of God. Which is why I think it's important that we actually do um, affirm the distinction between Roman Catholics and Christians. So the question raised, are you a Christian or are you Catholic? I think that's a good question. 
because, because it also, also exposes us to them the reality of their um, of, of their, their own thought process. That they're, they themselves are understanding and affirming that there is a clear distinction. And I think, I think we need to, uh, to, to, to affirm, affirm that as well. And so, so the thrust of my conversation yesterday was pretty much, much on justification. How is man in right God? How is man justified by God? And he says it's not fair that someone would, at the last moment, uh, repent and, and then all the things that they did in their life are absolved. And I said, so what about the human cross? Of course, they don't have a good answer to those things. And so especially the average child doesn't really know the Bible very well. So some things he explains, he said, those are Zaman cross, and he teaches this. And he was about that. And what's interesting about the man on the cross, that the thief of the cross is a real thing, but what's up is that in Luke's account of the Gospels, this is where he, he says, you know, uh, it says, remember me when you enter your kingdom of Jesus, so truly I say you would be in paradise. But did you know that Matthew's account of, 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 of the process, and Mark's account of the process, says that they were both mocking to Jesus? Think about, about that for a moment. Both men, both men, the next to Christ, and cross, were mocking to Jesus, including the thief that later asked for forgiveness. From, so, so for the standard, about six dollars, Jesus came on the cross. The man goes from a uh, a persecutor and one who loses parallel insults to Christ to then begging for mercy. Just at the same as the dollars. And what does Jesus do? He says, You'll be with me in paradise. So, so what happened in those six hours? Can a person truly repent and give their life over to Jesus on their deathbed? The answer is yes. And I know that it frustrates people and their sense of justice. But it's because he had not come to the true justice of God and grace. And so I said to him, he says, it's that justice that no, it's grace. It's grace. And that's a concept that is surely lacking in Roman Catholic circles. They do not have a good concept of grace. Has anyone ever had an experience similar to this or anything they want to ask or add uh, in regards to this conversation so far? Yes. Very similar conversation. Uh, all goes back to authority, mm -hmm. right? By what standard do you judge this to be wrong by? And when a person tells me, so well, by my standard. Okay, so based off your knowledge, your experience, and reasoning, you confirm this to be true. They say yes, okay. Well, let me ask you this. Would you agree that there are people out there with invalid thoughts of reasoning, like the thought process of a pedophile, or a rapist, or a murderer? Well, me, they're like, well, yeah, I would agree that they're, they're not reasonable. Well, how do you know you're not one of those people that has an invalid reason? Well, by my own reasoning, right. I know myself to be valid. And that's when I point them to the following their ways. Like, so by your own reasoning, you know your reasoning to be correct. Right. Right? That's right. You know, um, I learned yesterday, from my conversation yesterday, that uh, even I, I've been doing this for Long time. I've done moderated debates. I've spoken to many people in, uh, in various capacities. And, and, and so I know what I'm doing, generally. <laughs> but uh, I must say, even with my years of experience in apologetics and ministry and people, um, I don't think anyone here would accuse me, generally, of being harsh. But any time you're in a worldly context and you're standing up for truth, you, come, you may come across to them as harsh and uncary. Uh, even if you really try to season your words of soul, uh, truth to a world that despises the truth is like a sharp knife that is just us. And so as a Christian, you need to really try to do this as graciously as possible. But at the same time, I'm kind of a, a person that I, I can be maybe too much, too straightforward. And it really offends people. And so, so I find that sometimes people are more offended with delivery than the truth itself. And I find that to be ridiculous. <laughs> I'm a truth teller, and so I'd rather hear truth, it can be blunt or it can be soft. I'd rather get that truth, I want the substance of what is being said over the delivery. And people would overemphasize the delivery rather than the substance of argument. 
right? And, and so, so people often feel, well, maybe the, the person who's nicer, kinder, or who seems to be more open, that's the person who generally is just right for wins the day over the person who's more passionate and delivers a, a, sub, a substantive uh, issue, but maybe not as gracefully as the other person. And so, so substance matters, and I think substance matters over delivery. But delivery is still very important in the way that we uh, bring things across to unbelievers. Your thoughts, questions, or experiences, Manuel? Um, well, I guess I guess on the other side, could we also say that we're also Catholic with a little C, because we believe in the Apostles' Creed and we've been affected, we've been influenced by <coughs> Augustine and. People. Yeah, we have a good thing that seems to work with Catholics at times to say, hey, uh, you know, I'm a Catholic. If you want to see them like really like get confused saying, I'm a Christian, I'm a Protestant, I'm a Catholic. Mm -hmm. I'm like, I don't think those go together. And you can then explain what the word Catholic means. And that's fine. I think mean, that's, 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 that, that might even actually open up more of an opportunity for there to be some grace and camaraderie in that conversation um, when you're coming at them from a place of, of, of Seemingly openness and equal ground. I've been seeing people with Jehovah's Witnesses, by the way. I always get them in the room with you and I tell them, hey, I'm a GW too. I'm a Jesus Witness. I'm a Jesus Witness. And so, uh, yeah, and, and that, that is always usually a brief conversation I have with Jehovah's Witnesses as well. So, any thoughts or questions before we move on? Yes. Uh, you know, the person you're talking to, they're saying, like, by what? Is it, like, what do you say? By, not by what standard, but they're saying, like, how, what's just to you? Right. Um, you know, think a lot of times in these conversations, because of Romans 1, right, the law of God is written on everyone's hearts. Like, if you can probe at any level, you you find that we don't even live up to our own standards. That's right. right. You know, yeah. like everyone driving faster than you is a maniac. And everyone driving slower than you doesn't know how to drive, right? Exactly. <laughs> and this, this is, is why I said everyone's a different Everyone's a different It's like, I don't go to church with church, it's a I said, I have to manage for such a visit. Because we don't know, we never measure our own standard, our own God's standard. We always give ourselves a pass. Right. It's like, oh, if I need to break the speed, but I have good reason. Yeah. If he does it, he yeah. does not. Yeah, that's, that's right. right. That's, that's a great example. That's a great point. Uh, and so, so we don't even live with our own standard, our own God's standard. That's why I say we are all hypocrites. This is so very important. Jesus is the same as hypocrites. Jesus is the same as the sinners. And just, just like you must not go to war because there's just a person there, neither should you stop going to church because there's just a person there. This is where we find grace, where we find truth, where we find reconciliation and peace with God. And so that's, that's a really important thing to, 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 uh, uh, to call that, 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 that false notion. And of course, uh, you know, the Jewish accounts who bring this up ignore sometimes uh, the, the very hypocrite. That are in their own church. And the biggest is the mall they can build. The papacy itself has an office. There is no greater hypocrite than the papacy. The papacy is the greatest hypocrite, I believe, on the face of the earth. Because it claims authority and representation that doesn't belong to it. It claims to be something that is true or not. That's the greatest form of hypocrisy. It's a claim to be something that you're not. And then there's no greater uh, office of hypocrisy than that of the of the Roman Catholic Pope, which, in my understanding of scripture and theology, uh, fits the perfect description of the Antichrist and the Catholicism. And so, uh, we're going to examine some of the things with Roman Catholicism uh, in terms of the papacy. We had in Rome since chapter eight. We're going to pick up where we were going to talk some weeks ago. And again, and I brought up that conversation I guess you bring out because there's this perfect segue I've been mean, talking about authority and standards. So what's the standard? What's the authority? The, the process is very clear that the authority, that the, uh, the, the, the power that we, that we that we follow and trust in the scripture. That's the authority, that's the standard that we live by. We're going to have to confirm that on the surface, but if you dig deeper, just like with any other cult. And again, one of the controversial things, it's probably the most controversial thing I've said in regards to what calls is that I believe in this is cold. It's just, just a very big cold, but it's cold nonetheless. Um, and, uh, and what separates established Orthodox religion 
versus a cult is worth the authority is best in. And so, so the authority within the high control groups and cults are usually vested in one person or one group. That fits perfectly with the Catholicism. It is uh, a cult because it's vested ultimate authority within the offices of the agency. Uh, versus a baptism, for instance, where is the authority vested? It's really vested in three places. And we have three branches of government as, 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 a, as a government. Uh, we have three main branches for the believer in terms of authority. You know what those are? What's that? that? Well, the Trinity, for sure, certainly, uh, but uh, let's characterize the Trinity as one of the those is God, being the ultimate authority, obviously. What flows from that is Scripture, and then the Church. Right? So you have three layers of authority God, Scripture, and then you have the Church, meaning all the individual believers <coughs> have the authority. Uh, that is destined to us by the Lord through Scripture for the preservation of truth and the advancement of the kingdom of God. And so again, the, 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 there's, a, there's just three layers here that we're talking about. Versus the Roman Catholic way, which they would say is Scripture is in there, tradition, and the offices of the church. And so I would say the offices of the church are the process of the process. I would say the church, meaning all of us. Members of the body of Christ. Where the Roman Catholic would say, the authority is vested in the offices of the church, not in the church itself, but in the offices of the church, namely, both cardinals, bishops, priests. Okay. And that's a great distinction. And so, so what are some claims that Pope, uh, uh, Roman Catholics make about the, the, the Pope? That it's a direct descendant of Peter, and that Christ um, said that Peter. The rock, the one that would um, be in charge. That's right. And they call this apostolic primacy. Okay. Let me read to you what it says in the first chapter of the Council of Dogmatic Constitution of the Pastor Asseterus. It says this is a quote from the book in chapter 8. We therefore, for the preservation, safekeeping, and increase the Catholic flock with the approval of the sacred council. Do judge it necessary to propose to the belief and acceptance to all the faithful. So these are these are these very powerful declarations. You, you have to you have to hold this uh, uh, to be part of the universal church in, in Roman Catholicism. And of course, the ancient and constant faith of the universal church, the doctrine touching the institution, perpetuity, and nature of the sacred apostolic Christ. Okay. And so, in order for you to be within the Orthodox. Orthodoxy or Roman Catholicism, you must accept what is called the sacred apostolic primacy, which is oh, yeah. specifically the ACC. Uh, so not just a pope, but the office of pope. Um, and it continues on. We're going to remember all of this as well. I'll read this in sections here in the next page 104 uh, regarding. Uh, Kind of expounding on that, it says, We therefore teach and declare that the word is the testimony of the gospel and the primacy of jurisdiction over the universal church of God was immediately and directly promised and given to blessed Peter, the apostles by Christ the Lord. So here, here's the thing Christ had given primacy, jurisdiction, and authority to the universal, uh, over the universal church to St. Peter. Okay? So, so Matthew 16. Who do you say that I am? Uh, you are the Christ, the living God, as an absolute second by St. Peter. And then he says, and you are Peter. You know what the word Peter means, by the way? It means little rock. And then he says, you are Peter, little rock. And on this rock, so this is Petro, Petros, two words for rock. One means little, one means big. Mass, rock, mass. Versus one meaning small rock. Uh, he, he says, says, You are here, small rock, and on this <coughs> rock, big rock, I will build my church. And so, so is it is the Roman Catholic would say, Well, here, Peter's is called the rock. That's not true. According to the Greek, Petros was Petros. Peter is a small rock. 
who is part of that, this is what he, what Peter, the liberals are sort of writing in 1 Peter chapter 2, that we are all living in stones, little rocks that are making up what? This spiritual house for Christ, built on the foundation, not of Peter, but of Christ Jesus, who himself is his cornerstone. And so we are this living temple. Each of us are little Petras, little rocks that make up this Petro, this, this, this rock mass, this house that is the church. And so St. Peter is not, in Scripture, spoken of as being the rock by which the church is built on. Peter himself refers to the second verse of Peter chapter 2, that Christ is the rock. Christ is the foundation of the church, not himself. What a perfect opportunity Peter had, he wrote two letters to declare his supremacy over the people of God. He didn't. He doesn't. Nowhere in the scripture is Peter uh, uh, the supreme uh, apostle or the supreme uh, uh, pope. Uh, you won't see it, you won't find it. It's not a spiritual, not a spiritual concept. But here, according to Roman Catholic dogma, St. Peter is the one who is giving the supremacy order in the premises of jurisdiction. It was just to say that he has uh, uh, authority over the Roman church on earth. Uh, it goes on uh, a little further down. It says, uh, quoting from the scripture, uh, I will build my church, as he says, as he goes with the devil, our Peter, the small rock, the name of Peter, the small rock. You are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and he tells you how to come against it. I will give you to thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whenever thou shalt lie on earth, it shall be bound also in heaven. And whenever thou shalt lose us on earth, it shall be loosed also in heaven. So he uses that scripture to justify the authority and the primacy of St. Peter. But we understand correctly, this is not talking about St. Peter as an individual, but rather this is talking about the church having the keys of the kingdom. Not one individual, but rather the whole church, the whole, the whole of the leaders having this priestly, kingly, uh, uh, authority in the kingdom of God. So, so it's, it's not the Pope who has supremacy, and it's, it's not even the believer who has supremacy. It's, it's God who has supremacy, and He's given us keys of the kingdom to bind, to loose, have this agreement, agreement on earth that whatever we agree on, uh, uh, God will honor. What would there be to be agreement with if there's only one person? Who are we agreeing with? Right? If, if, if the Pope is the one who, who has this authority alone, where is the agreement? The agreement that presupposes is harmony. Presupposes one with one. And so clearly, this is the Roman Catholic House to have a good understanding of this. Uh, it says, a little bit about the variance, but this is very controversial in Holy Scripture, and it's been, uh, as it has been ever understood by the Catholic Church, are the perverse meaning of those who, while they distort the form of government as established by Christ the Lord and His Church, to deny that Peter in his single person, this is important, for preferably to all the other apostles, whether taken separately or together, was endowed by Christ to be true and proper primacy of jurisdiction, or of those who assert that the same primacy was not absolutely immediately and directly upon blessed Peter himself, but upon the church, and through the church on Peter as his minister. So he, they're, they're, they're apologetic and saying, well, there's some people who say that this wasn't given to Peter, but that it was given to the church. And then they try to say, you know, that, that Peter stood above the rest, stood above all the other apostles. But again, where do you find that in Scripture? You don't see it in the Scripture. Remember that Paul challenges Peter and rebukes him in Acts chapter 10, right? Where, you know, Peter's not dining with, uh, this is one of the Gentiles, right? And, uh, and later on, and in Galatians, he, he, he kind of sends another jab at, at Peter, respectfully, I believe, but he sends kind of another jab at Peter and those who have that same mentality of, of seeing those who were part of the Jewish brethren as superior to those who were the Gentile brethren, and looking at circumcision <coughs> as an issue, because that was one of the early debates between the Christian church, between the Jew, Jewish Christians and those who were Gentile believers, was the issue of circumcision. And Paul makes a clear in one of the main arguments uh, in Galatians is about the issue of circumcision. Really looking past circumcision, really talking about justification. Are you justified by the works of the law or are you justified through faith in Jesus Christ? 
And so Peter obviously affirms justification by faith, uh, affirms justification uh, um, um, through Christ, uh, and not by the works of all, not by um, um, you know, a certain decision. And we know this because in Acts 15, Peter uh, and, and, and James and others affirm justification by faith. That's what they call the Jerusalem's Council. The apostles all come together, they all think it's matter, and they affirm the fact that they are justified by faith. Uh, but the Roman Catholics, again, can say that uh, uh, the subscriber system is given not to the apostles as a whole, not to the church as a whole, but rather to the person of St. Peter. It says, if anyone therefore shall say that let us hear the apostles was not appointed prince of all the apostles, and that the visible head of the whole church of militant, or that the same directly to be the agency of our Lord Jesus Christ, the primacy of honor only, and not of true common jurisdiction, let him be anathema. Do you know what the word anathema means? Cursed, separate, cast it off. That's what they mean by that. So if you don't affirm the supremacy of St. Peter, of the papacy, you are an anathem. An anathem is not just like a slap on the wrist. It is the highest form of judgment that the Roman Catholic Church can, can pronounce. Uh, it means that you are outside the church, that you are a pure heretic, that you are lost. There's no salvation for you. Uh, and so to be anathematized is, 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 is a pretty, pretty big deal in Roman Catholic services. And you don't affirm the supremacy of the agency. You are an anathem. What they don't know, unfortunately, is that Paul already anathemizes them in Galatians chapter 1. Let's, let's go there for a moment. moment. authority here is different. 
Paul's saying if you distort the gospel of Christ, you're anathema. Anything so the gospel is supreme. But the Roman Catholic say, if you if you dare talk about the dear leader, it's almost like North Korea. Have you seen Dr. Mitchell in North Korea? You have to have a picture of the dear leader everywhere, you know, in each room. And you can't even expect a testament. You always have to buy what the dear leader says. And if you don't listen to the leader, you're going to be cut off. You're going to be anathema. You're going to be sent to, to the version of the Bula. Okay. And Roman Catholics have a spiritual uh, version of this, where if you don't agree with your leader, you don't agree with our chance of authority. You're an athlete, you're on the side of the camp. So quickly we begin to see uh, what Roman Catholics believe in regards to the authority of the Roman Catholic uh, uh, Pope. Uh, I'm going to jump over here to the Roman Catholic writer Carl Gibbons who wrote this in certain cases. This is, this is important, I think. The Catholic Church teaches that our Lord would convert on the same given the first place of modern jurisdiction and government of the whole church, that the same spiritual authority has always resided in the popes or bishops of Rome. So the Pope is basically just the, the bishop of Rome, the archbishop of Rome, the, 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 the prime bishop of, of, that, of that, uh, that place. As being successors for St. Peter. Consequently, to be true followers of Christ, all Christians, among, both among the clergy and laity, must be in communion with the see of Rome, where Peter rules in the person of his successor. So, what they've done is they've made a cult surrounding the successor of Peter, Peter's successor. Uh, let me ask the same questions that. James Whitebread is here. What, what do these statements mean? And what is Rome claiming concerning the papacy? What do these statements mean? And what are the claims that are being made here concerning the papacy? That's right. Is that what we call it? I can find this in a lot of circles. We're calling Roman Catholicism cult because it's a major religion because one point two million years is that I'm going to call it a martyr cult or cult. The Jehovah's Witnesses start off with seven hundred followers and has eight million followers. Is that not? Is that even not a cult? No, I think they're just growing or growing cult of worship. What else uh, 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 do you see here in regards to the claims being made concerning the agency? Basically, if you're not of Rome, you're not a true follower of Christ, so it kind of determines your state of salvation. Yeah. Look, listen to this. To be true followers of Christ, all Christians, both in the clergy and the clergy, do you know what the clergy and the clergy are? The church offers and the people. Yeah, yeah. so the clergy usually is referenced to church majorities, priests, even people who have been processed in the right S-E-E-S-E-A. The Sea of Rome. 
This is a historical phrase that has been used for hundreds of years in reference to the supreme agency of a Roman, of a bishop of Rome. Now, when it talks about the see of Rome, it's, it's, it's referred to his, he's the final uh, pastor. So the book is his right, is a, is a supreme pastor. He's the one who sees everything. Right? So think of someone who's in the highest point. Uh, this is what the word arc means. I think you've heard the term arc bishop. Arc is supposed to be word arcane, meaning the chief stone. The kind of, uh, there's a, uh, one of these uh, archways on the archways. And the, there's a stone that kind of connects it to, and that's where we get the word arcane. It means the supreme the thing that holds all things together. And Christ is actually referred to in Bottom chapter 1 as the arcane of creation. He's the arcane of creation. It's uh, also in Revelation chapter 14. Christ is referred to as the archae of all creation, meaning that he is the center of all. He's the thing that's holding all things together in creation. And yet they use this as a description of the Pope. He's the, he's, he's the archae of the church. He's the one who sees everything. He's, a, he's a, the, the primal authority of the visible church. Uh, that is blasphemous. Amen? Yes. That's blasphemous. This is another subtle way in which they are claiming the what well, truly belongs to Christ in his office, and they are claiming it for the book of himself. So that, that, that is literally the definition of man Christ. It's literally the definition of man Yes. So in other words, it's kind of saying that um, with the Sea of Rome, you need to be in communion with the Sea of Rome, meaning that your vision must be the vision of the Pope in regards to all the state of Rome and all those who are outside of Rome. Your vision must be aligned with the Pope's vision. Right. Yeah, he's, he's, he's the king of the, of the Roman Catholic Church. He's the one who oversees everything. He's the final, he's the archive of the church. So, uh, pretty dangerous things here, obviously. And so, uh, this is a clear teaching in Roman Catholicism. And I'm going to do that today because uh, time won't allow. Uh, but I've got so many um, resources and quotes. In regards to some of the claims uh, that are made about papacy, uh, from their own writings, from their own, um, uh, you know, catechism, for instance, that they can take a claim regarding uh, the Pope. And so, one of the things that's important here is, is dissecting the main text. Let's look to uh, Matthew chapter 16 for a moment. This is a, a verse of scripture that we use often in this church because I think it's, it's one that is often misunderstood. And we're going to kind of this a little bit just for, for more clarity. Uh, it says in verse 15, Jesus asked the this question. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? Second Peter replied, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Son of God, for flesh and blood, as I have revealed this to you, my Father who is heaven. But I tell you, you are Peter. Petras. Means small rock. But, and on this rock, meaning Petras, so this is the rock mass. Uh, a good <coughs> translation would be actually rock mass, not just rock. rock. It, it, it means something that's bigger. Now, now this rock, or this rock, rock mass, I will build my church, and the gates of hell, Hades shall not go against it, and I will give you the keys of the kingdom. The question is, who is the you? Okay. Because the Roman Catholics say the you is Peter, meaning that Peter singularly has the keys of the kingdom. So it says, you, um, uh, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whenever you buy on earth, you pound in heaven. Whenever you lose on earth, you lose in heaven. And so the question is, who's he? I think the you is clearly the church that he just spoke of. I will give, he says, I will build my church on this rock, the rock mass. So it's not just a the, 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 the little rock, the Peter, but it's rather on this grand rock, the singular church of Christ. 
I will give you the, the keys of the kingdom of heaven, whatever you buy on earth should be bound in heaven, meaning that there's priestly, kingly authority that is vested in the people of God, collectively, collectively. Which is why, if you're in this church, we, we have a pretty serious view of church membership. If you're at our last members meeting, we have a very robust discussion on this subject as well. And we're going to continue to have that discussion because it is very relevant. Not just as we deal with Roman Catholics, but where we come to the right understanding of our right places as people of God. And so when we come together, that we share this authority, that we finally lose. This is not something that's allowed to be defeated or simulated as a as an individual as all for rather to the whole people of God. And we know this is to be true, so I want you to turn now to the first Peter. Chapter 2. Again, Peter does not affirm his supremacy, but rather what he says in verse 2, chapter 2, starting in verse 4. He says, As you come to him, a living stone, he's clearly harking back to Matthew. Uh, 16, when the Lord spoke to him and says, you are here, small stone, you know, this great stone, this big rock, uh, with my church. He says, as you come to a living stone, rejected by men, and the sight of God shows into the precious, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priest to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. What is the stark difference between what Peter is saying and the papacy? The papacy says that the, pain, that the Pope is that one of God, that God has chosen in his precious, that the Pope is that living stone, that the Pope is that spiritual house, that the Pope is that holy precious, but that's not what Peter says. Peter says, you are that living stone. You are that shows in the precious nation. You are that living stone that has been built up as a spiritual house. You are that holy priest that offers a spiritual sacrifice to the God of Jesus Christ. He goes on to the scripture where it stands in scripture. He goes on to the stone of the cornerstone shows in the precious. And whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So the one to whom we're that the scripture points to is the Pope or is Christ. It's Christ. Christ is that precious cornerstone by which we place our faith in Him. We will not be put to shame. What a stark contrast from putting our faith in the Pope. Because if you put your faith in one Pope, another Pope may come later and come victim. And you will be put to shame. But rather, we put our faith in Christ are not put to shame. It says uh, in verse 7 For the honor is for you who believe. And for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders reject will become the cornerstone. And a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. No wonder, as I opened up this morning with that discussion on the Roman Catholic, they quickly took the fence. Why? Because Christ is that rock of offense, and people will be offended. People will be offended. And they stumble. So why do people stumble and not accept the gospel? Because they disobey the word. And then those are the things. As they were destined to do. So here you have a perfect dichotomy that shows the truth of Calvinism, for instance. You have your personal responsibility. You disobey the word. You were responsible. But you were also destined to this destruction. Destined to it. So they stumbled. Because they disobey the word. So it's a personal rejection, personal agency there. But they were destined to do this. Why? Because the reality is, brothers and sisters, we, according to our fallen nature, are all corrupt. We're all lost. Every single person. But it's only in the gospel, it's only through in Jesus Christ, it's only through God's solid work of redemption and his grace that he pulls us out of. That path of destruction and grants us to give our last life. It is total work of God. You are totally deprived. And the only thing that will save you of your total uh, depravity is the total work of Christ. Not your work, but his finished work. 
It says, says it continues to say in verse 9, but you are a chosen race of a royal priest of a holy nation, of a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. That's the true priest of Christ, mm -hmm. is the believer. We are the priests of Christ, not the papacy. The, nowhere here do you see the supremacy of Peter. But rather, he sees the supremacy of Christ and his people. That's where the authority is vested. And so I think Peter is actually giving us a great favor that he's exegeting Matthew 16 for us. He's showing and demonstrating who is that priestly nation, who has the authority, who can bind and lose things on heaven and on earth. It's the people of God. He's saying it here. And one opportunity he had to say otherwise, to say that he has that authority. But Peter never claims that authority for himself. Rather, he makes it clear that this is for the church, that this is for the whole people of God. So again, this is not teaching the supremacy of the papacy. Pretty clear. And again, Peter, if we're going to trust Peter, if Peter is that first goal, we should probably listen to him, right? <coughs> Nor does he teach anything opposite to what we just said. So I think that fills the papacy, uh, the idea of the papacy right away, because the papacy does not have any burden of proof. Does not have any exegetical or historical proof in the first few centuries of the church that showed that Peter's successors were that great, uh, uh, you know, the three months. The idea of the papacy is actually really starts coalescing around the same time as the fall of Rome. And so, so Rome as a whole power begins to weaken, and where did the emperor of Rome dwell and reign from? What, what city? The city? Vatican. Well, yes, yes, but also so the Vatican is your invention. But for Rome, Rome is the city of Seven Hills. That's where the, uh, the emperor uh, <coughs> uh, would uh, reign from. And as the political system of Rome started to deteriorate, what started to come into place was the spiritual institution and political institution of Rome, which is the Roman Catholic Church. So as the, as the emperor began losing political power, the spiritual head of Rome started gaining more power. And so what was left to happen was just a swap between the political emperor and now there's a spiritual emperor called the Pope. But it's the same office, it's the same thing. As a matter of fact, the Vatican. Uh, is the ancient place where the uh, uh, literally the, the emperor reigned from. So if you ever look at St. Peter's Basilica, St. Peter's Basilica was actually uh, uh, finished being completed around the time of the Reformation. Uh, it took us several hundred years for St. Peter's Basilica to be built. In fact, Martin Luther, uh, one of the reasons that he got very upset was because they were trying to sell gold to pay for St. Peter's Basilica. Uh, uh, but if you look at St. Peter's Basilica, which is that place where the Pope gives mass every Sunday, and it's one of the famous uh, places where um, there's a new Pope elected, that's where everyone gathers. There's this huge obelisk in the middle. Okay? You know who read the obelisk? Nero. Okay? This was erected in the time of Nero to celebrate what was called the. Uh, the when a bunch of this, it was a lot of great, but I was just giving the introduction. Nero Circus. Sir, uh, Circus Neuronius, I think is what it was called. Uh, and so the, uh, you have these games, these, these circuses. It's not circuses like we go today with like, it's all nice and fun and family friendly. Circuses in ancient Rome were very barbaric. And in Nero's circus, Christians were being murdered and martyred. So the very place in which Christians were martyred and their blood was spilled, and the very uh, uh, obelisk that was erected to commemorate such a thing is now the center of the authority and the seat of the Pope of Rome. Pretty interesting stuff, huh? These are one of many reasons why I believe that the Pope is the son of tradition, man of lawlessness, the Antichrist, if you want to use that phrase. Because they're, you know, as Charles Spurgeon puts it, if the Pope is the Antichrist, no one else could be. Because it's so clear from history and scripture that it fits all the uh, criteria for this uh, sense of tradition. 
Any, Any thoughts, thoughts or questions? questions? Again, the burden of proof falls on Rome to demonstrate something other than what the scripture says and what other claims about the Pope. Uh, there are no claims made in the scripture of one unilateral office other than the office of Christ. And how do we know this? If you read the book of Hebrews, Christ is one of the, one of the things that is emphasized in the book of Hebrews is, is the grand supremacy of Christ is all things. I'll talk about chapter 1 again. Christ is supreme over creation. He's supreme over the angels. And then he's also in chapters, in chapters 5 through 8 of, of Hebrews. Christ is also shown to have a supreme office in that he is supreme over all the offices ever spoken of in the scripture. And it says that he is that Melchizedek priest. He is that Melchizedek king. He's that Melchizedek priest that we're looking forward to. Because the original no office is greater than Christ. Again, yes. Hebrew fails to mention any yes. other office yes. except for Christ. Mm-hmm. Well, that's not uh, in, in chapter 13, if you're going to talk about uh, uh, shepherds, uh, bishops, bishops, which, which is, is the opposite of an elder. And so, so uh, although the actual Hebrews are speaking, Paul is not under the shepherd of Christ. Christ. So, so they're, they're under the authority of Christ. Nowhere is there a, a, a vicar, nowhere is there a Primal or supreme apostle, uh, it is it's all Christ. Christ, Christ is, that, is that supreme apostle. You know, it's just true. Hebrews chapter 3, chapter three, three verse 1. Christ, Christ is all an apostle. You know that? He is all an apostle. He is that grand apostle uh, that is uh, pointing to the scripture. So, three fascinating things there. Any other thoughts or questions in regards to some of the materials that we went over? The rest, the rest of the chapter, chapter is essentially as uh, things as an exegesis and analysis of the scripture, which is essentially what we use just now uh, in regard to the fallacies of the claims of the Roman. And so again, no worries, the scripture is even remotely point to such a vicar uh, that no one points to in Peter and in the Pope. And for us, it's almost like, it's, 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 it's almost too, too obvious, obvious, isn't it? It's almost too obvious, and it's almost like we don't have to spend a lot of time there. Uh, but I would encourage you uh, to look at some dates that we had um, with James White and Father uh, Michael Pacquan, I think his name is, where, he, where they go deep and have this three-hour debate on, on, on the papacy. And this is really old, so it's probably from the 90s. So James White had hair back then. And, uh, <laughs> and he's a little bit bigger than he is now. Uh, but a really great debate between him and uh, I think it's Mitch, yeah, Father Michael Pacquo or something like that. Was this Mitch Pacquo? No, Mitch Pacquo is someone that's a scientist. He's not that Asian guy with the But he might be. But I think Pacquo is like the last thing. And they have a great uh, three hour debate on the, on the issue. And there's there certain things that. That, uh, that the priest brings up that almost sound like the onset, but quickly the theory under the way of scripture. Quickly the theory. Um, and, it's, and it's almost too obvious, but uh, I, I still think we should just uh, uh, dismiss it altogether. And I think the reason why we should dismiss it is because I think there's prophetic um, significance here. Again, I, you, I, I made my position known pretty clearly. I believe that the Pope is the Antichrist. The Pope is the, is, is the Southern tradition that's the Pope of the Scripture of Mary Wallace's. Uh, and uh, so I think there's just lots of significance here. So I don't want to just to say, oh, I'll put it in the wall. There's really powerful reasons why I'm wrong. It's because there's a spirit of deception where he's like, that's what he's instructed to, that's what he's That is lying in the mind of the Pope just to accept this authority as being true. So there's a spirit of deception that's what we and uh, because there's a certainty of the system that's working here, I don't think we should quickly be too quick to dismiss some of the things that are being made. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. So, yeah. yeah. What would be, what well, I guess, wrong with dismissing it? Because I think that's what we like Rome's view in regards to like, Eastern Orthodoxy. Because, like, you know, Eastern Orthodoxy would be more sort of closer to Rome mm-hmm. compared to us as Protestants. Mm-hmm. So, like, what's kind of like Rome's view in regards to the state of like, Eastern Orthodoxy and so forth? Yeah, I mean, there's a fascinating uh, similarity between the Orthodox Church. The bit of the matter that you should ask, because I don't think that uh, well, Roman Catholicism has already played it and amplifies, you know, the Eastern Church. Church. Yeah. But uh, more recent discussion 
uh, around these sort of forms of Catholicism is that you know what, what I see Rome doing is they're really trying to reel them back in. And you think they're trying to move with the process, right? So you have the book come along, like Christian programs, and say, oh, we just all need to come together again. Yeah. And there's like a softer tone from the papacy in regard to kind of welcoming people back into, into, into the love of the folks, is what they call it. Uh, and so uh, the, the, the main distinction between Orthodoxism and Catholicism is the thing of voting. So uh, they don't, I mean, Orthodox and Eastern Orthodoxism, they don't have a vote, they do have an archbishop, which is such a thing as a main vote. But he doesn't quite claim all the powers and authority that the vote would, uh, but it's still very similar. Uh, and so Roman Catholicism sees them as, I think I would use uses the term sister church. Mm -hmm. that, they, that they came from the same vein uh, that they departed on the other parts of the same as the Roman Catholic Church departed. They're actually more white than that. And that really you just see the Roman Catholic Church consolidating more power and agency uh, versus uh, the Orthodox Church more maintained what seemed to be the government of the ancient church, which was uh, uh, bishops and, and, uh, and pastors, you know, having authority and uh, and I think the Orthodox, Eastern Orthodox Church, I think their main bishop was the bishop of, uh, of Egypt, I'm not mistaken. So and that's how those ancient times didn't change because it kept going around. But yeah, they, they would in some sort of refer to the Orthodox Church as the sister church that needs to be brought back. Again, so, any last thoughts or questions? Was this what I do want to do is that I just want to spend a little bit more time in this chapter because I, there's some scriptures I want to examine. And so kind of starting in verse in, in, in page 113, we're going to, we're going to uh, come back to that next week and look at some more of the scriptures and some more of the things that we made. So let me close this prayer and then we can get into service. Father, we do thank you that you are a God that has given us clarity through your word. You've given us this truth in scripture that we should hold on to. Know the Lord that we are that true, uh, that Precious stone uh, that uh, that people of God that you have uh, men uh, spoken of in Scripture uh, that we are indeed that holy nation that royal priesthood uh, that offers spiritual sacrifices uh, through Jesus Christ. Father, help us to uh, recognize who we are in Jesus and to also lovingly uh, but boldly proclaim the truth of the gospel uh, to those who are perishing. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, see you guys. Service.